So in this video, we'll discuss problem number four from the 2023 AP Calc A, B, and B, C exams. This problem involves a graph of a derivative, and most years the free response set does have a problem kind of like this. So in this particular problem, we have a graph of f prime, and we're told that the function f is defined on the interval negative 2 to 8, f of 2 is 1, and then the graph of f prime is given, and it's got two line segments along with this semicircle. Part A says, do we have a relative min, max, or neither at the x of 6 for f? Give a reason for your answer. So I hear a task about relative min, relative max, or neither, and instantly I'm going to want to go to a sign chart to try to figure out what my conclusion is. And to get a conclusion about a relative min, max, or neither, it would have to be a sign chart for f prime. So what values does f prime have the opportunity to change at? Well, f prime would have to first be 0, which happens three times, or undefined, which happens not at all on this graph for this interval. So the three times when f prime could change would be the x of negative 1, the x of 2, and the x of 6. So we do have to worry about 6 being a max or a min. If, if 6 wouldn't have been in this sign chart, it definitely would have been neither of those two. What's the sign of f prime on each of the intervals that we've identified in our sign chart. Now this is a graph of f prime, so we're not looking at slopes, we're looking at y values. Y values go positive, negative, positive, positive. So we have that progression across the sign chart. Now what's happening at 6? We're positively sloped to the left of 6 for f of x. We're positively sloped to the right of 6 for f of x. So although f prime of 6 is equal to 0, the function is increasing on both sides of x equals 6, and that tells us that we have neither a max nor a min on f of x at this x. You could have used different rationale. You could have said f prime of x is positive on both sides of x equals 6. Uh, one thing you have to watch out for is doing something like this. If you say f prime of x is increasing, that's now a statement about the second derivative, which is definitely not something that we're wanting to do when we're developing a conclusion about a relative max or a relative min unless our intention is to use the second derivative test, which is definitely not what we're going for with our work on this screen. Part B is a question about concavity. Where is the function going to be concave down? So concavity is going to be having to do with the second derivative. So you do have to recognize what you need to look at on this graph to determine values of f double prime. This is a graph of f prime. f double prime is the derivative of the graph Therefore, we're going to look at slopes on the graph to determine values of that graph's derivative. So when does the slope on the graph have the opportunity to change signs? Well, as we first pass through these undefined slope locations, cusps, or this one location where we have a horizontal tangent. So 0, 4, and 6 are the places where the second derivative has the opportunity to change signs. What is the sign of the second derivative on each interval? Well. We're looking at slopes, negative, positive, negative, positive. Where are we concave down? Anywhere where the sign of the second derivative is negative. Your reason for your answer can't be the sign chart. The reason does have to be verbal. So since f double prime is less than 0 on the intervals negative 2 to 0 and 4 to 6, those are the intervals where f of x is concave down. Also make sure you recognize what an open interval is. An open interval does not include endpoints. So an open interval is going to be specified with parentheses rather than with brackets. Not going to lie, I messed up part C a couple of times. So this is actually take three for part C. I see a limit within a free response question, and I have the tendency to think I'm going to need to use L'Hopital's rule. So when I use L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to need to show that I'm checking the limit of the numerator and the denominator independent of one another and show that they're both zero or show that they're both undefined. Uh, one of my issues earlier on was that I was looking at this graph as a graph of f, and when I, need, when I needed f of 2, right, when I put 2 in place of this x, I need the value of f of 2, I took the value of 0. Uh, that is not right because... This is not a graph of f, this is a graph of f prime. So what I recognized is that they gave me f of 2 right here. Uh, so 
6 times f of 2 is 6 times 1. Minus 3 times 2 does give me 0 for the numerator. Denominator is a little more straightforward to analyze. You just put 2 in place of the x's. You do get 0 there. That does give you the opportunity to apply L'Hopital's rule, right? Any instance of 0 over 0 or plus or minus infinity or over plus or minus infinity. So I'm, I'm showing that the original limit is equal to the limit I'm writing out next via an application of L'Hopital's rule. So I do the derivative of the numerator. I do the derivative of the denominator. After doing so, I attempt to reevaluate by putting two back in place of my x's. This fraction right here would not receive full credit on the AP exam because it depends on f prime of two. I do need to recognize what f prime of two is. This is a graph of f prime, f prime of two is the y value on that graph at two, which is zero. Now this fraction right here would receive full credit. Uh, if you were to simplify it, I think you're gonna recognize negative three is how the numerator simplifies. Negative one is how the denominator simplifies. Dividing those two gives you an end result of positive three. There's something that I meant to take out. That was one of my botched attempts at that uh, when I was using the graph the wrong way. Ignore that. We'll go on to the last part of the problem. So part D says find the absolute minimum value of F on the closed interval negative two to eight, justify your answer. So when you're trying to justify an absolute max or an absolute min on the AP exam, you want to show that you're analyzing all of the candidates for where those might occur. And the candidates would be the endpoints of your interval. So you're going to have to consider negative two. You're going to have to consider eight, as well as any critical numbers within it. So the critical numbers within the interval would be places where the first derivative is equal to zero. And we already identified those back in part A. They were negative one, two, and six. These locations where we were crossing the x-axis, or not crossing, but touching the x-axis with the graph of f prime. I need to compare the y value or the function value at each of those candidates. Now, in this particular problem, there are some shortcuts that you can take to not have to do quite as much computation. Back in part A, we identified six as neither a max nor a min. Therefore, there's no way it's the absolute min. If it's not a local min or an endpoint, it cannot be the absolute min. Now, another bit of logic I applied based on the sign chart from part A, remember what that sign chart looked like. We had positives for the derivative sign from two to six, and then again from six to eight. So the function is increasing on the interval two to eight. I'm not gonna have a low point on the graph of f at eight. I'm gonna have a potential high point, but definitely not a low point since I'm increasing until I end my graph at the x of eight. So those I got out of the way right away. Uh, one more I got out of the way right away, and that was at negative one. Also using the logic from the sign chart in part A, f prime goes from positive to negative at the x of negative one. That's a local maximum. There's no way that a local maximum can be the location of an absolute minimum. So there's really only two locations left for us to analyze, the x value of two and the x value of negative two. Now the x value of two, they've already given us the function value for that, that's one. So I don't have to do any work for that. Now for the x value of negative two, that is a bit trickier. So I'm gonna have to take the function value that I know and that's at the x value of 2, right? So take the function value that I know from the x of 2 and add on how much the function value changes by by integrating the rate of change of the function, which is the derivative of the function, from the spot that I knew the value at to the spot that I would like to know the value. Now, if you're going to use signed area arguments, and if you've done enough problems like this, you better realize you are in this case, you do want these limits of integration to be in the proper numerical order in order for you to have area beneath the x-axis being returned as a negative, area above being returned as a positive. So I did swap the limits of integration and change the sign out in front of the integral so that my signed area arguments would work out to be the way that I want them. And so what's my integral from negative 2 to 2. Uh, so I have this triangle from negative 1 to 2 that sits below the x-axis. Because it sat below the x-axis, when I found its area, 1 half base of 3, height of 2, I just 
negated that because that space was sitting below the x-axis. And then I have a pink triangle here that sits above the x-axis, one half base of, kind of messed up the base and the height order there, but it doesn't matter. Multiplication is commutative, so the order doesn't matter. Uh, and then this calculation would be my value for f of negative two. Now, you do need to have the ability to do a direct comparison between any of these candidates. Now, three of them are already ruled out, but we need to know what the value of this is, compare it to one. The smaller of those two is going to be our absolute minimum. So I was out of room on this screen, so I just went to a new screen, simplified that calculation that we saw on the prior screen a little bit. I realized I, I got a value of three for the function at negative two. Clearly one is smaller than three. So all function values of f on f, I should say of f of x, not on, of f of x exceed one on the interval negative two to eight. So our absolute minimum occurs at the x value of two and is one. Watch out for the wording. It does say find the absolute minimum value of f. Every once in a while it says find that x value where the absolute min is or where the absolute max is. So I'm typically going to write out a conclusion where I specify both. The minimum value is the function value. The x where it occurs in this case is 2.